1 Timothy chapter 3. Chapter 3. 1 Timothy chapter 3. I know a lot of times um, people get the notion that pastors just make up things, you know, that they just kind of get something in their mind the way they want it, and they just make up rules, that kind of stuff. But I want especially those that are new um, to salvation to know that there is a reason, even if it's not every time something is said, it's given in the scripture. There is a reason behind it. And I want to show you here in Timothy how this is demonstrated to us as God's people in 1 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 14. Paul says, These things write I unto thee, hoping to come unto thee shortly. Now, it was his desire to be there. It was his desire to, um, to come in and help mentor Timothy even more than he had but he wasn't able to go always when he wanted and so he wrote letters so he's he's telling him that I'm writing this to you with the hopes of being able to come but in verse 15 but if I tarry long or if I'm not able to come for a long time uh, but if I tarry long that thou mayest know how thou oughtest to behave thyself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of truth. So by implication, when he tells him that you ought to know how to behave yourself in church, it is telling us that there is something expected of our behavior when we come to church, right? If I say you ought to know how to do something, then that means there's something that you should do. So to say, to say that, uh, and I'm very, very careful when I talk to people about how they behave, how they dress, how they look when they come to church. I'm very careful to not say something. It says this in the Bible. I don't always say that because sometimes it doesn't say that in the Bible. It doesn't. Maybe what I'm talking about isn't specifically written out in the Bible. But just because something is not in the Bible does not mean that you can just act any kind of way you feel like it when you come to church. We come to church for the purpose of being strengthened by each other's fellowship, to hear the word of God and be encouraged for instruction on how we should live our lives. There are times when we come, maybe not necessarily with the expectation of rebuke, but that's what we get because that's what God wants for us. So when we come to church, then there is a certain amount of behavior that is expected from somebody. We don't come into church running and playing and laughing and joking and clowning because this, by virtue of the fact that this is where we come to meet God, is a holy place. When God told the children of Israel to build a tabernacle for him out in the wilderness, he told them to bring an offering. Bring me an offering and this much gold, this much silver, this much brass. I need this kind of wood. He had a whole grocery list of things. And those people brought it all to them. They took their earrings off and all that and brought it so it could be melted down. And gold could be used for the building of the temple or the tabernacle uh, out in the wilderness. 
goat skins and badger skins and sheep skins, all kinds of things that God asked for. When the people gave it, it was common. Wasn't it? They went and got it out their houses, took it off their bodies. When they brought it, it was common. But once it was given to God, now it's sacred. Does that make sense? When they built the tabernacle, if you walked up in there and you wasn't the priest, you was going to die. Although when it was first, when they was bringing all the materials, there was nothing to it. But once it was consecrated, now it is set apart for God's use. Now not just anybody can come in here because God would kill them. And I, I know I've heard preachers say this for many years that um, they, they used to put bells on the bottoms of the high priest's robes and tie a rope around his ankle. That way if he went into the Holy of Holies and wasn't right, they could drag him out because they couldn't go in there and get him. But the Bible doesn't say that nowhere. Matter of fact, I think the first time it was written about historically was in the 1600s, 15, 1600, somewhere around there. So there's no real truth to that. But there is some real truth to the fact that if the high priest went in there other than when he was supposed to, with what he was supposed to, God would kill him. Now, there's some truth to that. God was so specific that the Levites, when, they were, when it was time for them to move, the Levites were to take the, the Holy of Holies and all the, the, the instruments that were in the ark, I mean in the uh, uh, tabernacle, they were to take all of it and cover it. Then the tribe of Kohath would come and they would carry it. But before it was covered, they couldn't even come in and touch it. They could only touch it after it was covered. Why? Because God had an order to the way he wanted things done. Right? Why are y'all just kind of looking at me? Is, 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 is that, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not rebuking anybody. But I know we have new folks here, and I see children just running all up on the, the pool pit. One of them's one of my kinfolk. Amen. But I'm, I'm even cleaning my house, too. Amen. Not just one of them, more than one. I don't see them here tonight, but I got some that'll run up here and get up on the pulpit. Now I got to stop all that. It's not because, it's not because the material things here are so holy and sacred. It's not that. It is the fact that this is, it, it's deserving of a certain amount of respect. It does. If we say, which is another thing that's not true, but or just not accurate, we say, you know, come on, lift your hands up and clap your hands and let's usher in the presence of the Lord. You can't usher in the presence of the Lord. The presence of the Lord is when the word of God is being spoken. Let me, let me get a scripture real quick on that one. I know we know where it is. Um, but I'll show you again in the book of Genesis, chapter number something. Mm. Chapter number three, verse number seven. This is after Adam and Eve ate of the fruit that God told them not to eat from. And the eyes of them both were opened, and they knew that they were naked. And they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves apron, aprons. And they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God amongst the trees in the garden. Now, it says the voice of the Lord was the presence of God. When did Adam and Eve hide themselves? When the presence of the Lord came. It wasn't hiding all day. It wasn't until the evening time when the voice of the Lord was being heard. Then they hid themselves. So when we say we want to come into the presence of the Lord, 
The presence of the Lord is when the word of God is being brought forth. It's not the, the music. It's not in shouting. That's not the presence of the Lord. That's just feeling the spirit of God, the anointing. You can do that at home. You can sing at home. You can play instruments at home. But you're not preaching at home. We, the Bible says, forsaking not the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is. We should not forsake the assembling of ourselves together. Some people don't believe they got to go to church. But if you want to be right with God, you've got to go to church. You've got to come. Why? Because when the presence of the Lord comes in, that's when we find out we're trying to hide something. You can stay home all day long. Feel like you're okay. You know, it's one thing when you're sitting at home. It's one thing when you're on your job. One thing when you're out at the park or out to dinner, we do things to get our mind off of wrong. But when you come to church, ain't no place to hide, is it? No. No, no place to hide because now the presence of the Lord is coming. The voice of the Lord is being heard. How? Through the preaching. That's why it's so important for preachers to be in tune with God. Because when the preacher is preaching, they're speaking what God wants his people to hear. So and what, let me just dispel one more myth. Preachers, I've heard them say this a lot too. You know, um, I studied this message, but when I got to church, God changed it because you was here and the Lord knew you needed to hear this. God knew they was going to be there that day before they was born. You didn't surprise him. That's not the reason why God does that. If anything, it's to keep the preacher from meddling with the message. You, I'll let you stay busy studying whatever, but when you get to church, then I'm going to give you what I want you to preach. That way you ain't going to try to add some stuff into it and make it be something different. I'm going to spring it on you. It's more that than anything. Now, that's from the book of David. <laughs> One thing I do know for sure, you're not surprising God. He knew you was going to show up. He knew that. So we can count that. We can just disqualify that as a reason why the preacher, God changes the message at the last minute. It's not because he saw that you was here. He knew. All right. The rest of it, that's me. I feel like that. I feel like God keeps you from meddling with the message. Because sometimes you can overthink something. Or you can kind of change it the direction you want it to go. But when God throws it on you at the last minute, you got to go where he's leading you because you're stuck out there now. I got to trust you. All right, let's move on. And so verse four, or chapter 4 and verse 1, <clears throat> in, back in 1 Timothy, 1 Timothy chapter 4, He's telling us in chapter 3 that there is a way you ought to behave yourself when you come to church. So does the Bible say that a, a man can't wear a hat up in the church? He says it's a shame for him to, yeah, you can't. You shouldn't come in and pray with your head covered. That's why a lot of times you'd be at restaurants and you see somebody take their hat off before they pray for their food, before they offer thanks, because they don't want to pray with their head covered. But, well, I can't find you in here, and it might be, but I can't find it where it says, thou shall not wear a hat in church. But we do that because it's, it's a thing of respect. And the sisters, the Bible says that they, they should pray with their head covered. So if a sister comes in with her head with a hat on, that's fine. But don't brothers come up in here with hats on. Now, me personally, even when there's nobody here, I'm all by myself working, and I got to cut through and do something. If I got a cap on, when I come up through that door, I take it off, walk all the way through, and when I get to the back door, then I put it back on again because I don't want to walk through the church with my hat on. That's not, a, that's not a rule. 
That's not in the Bible. That's just respect I want to give. That's all. I think we should respect God. All right. So now, there are some, though, who just never want to get on board. Look at this. Chapter 4, verse 1. Now the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter time some shall depart from the faith. What makes you depart from the faith? Sin, temptation. When you don't have a made up mind that I'm going to serve God, when you don't put God in his proper place, it is easy to walk away from God. Some shall depart from the faith doing what? Giving heed to seducing spirits. There are things in the world that will tempt you, that will seduce you to do wrong. I know we think that women are the only things that can seduce somebody. No. There's cars that can seduce people, houses that can seduce people. Money seduces some people. There's so many things. You know why? Because it's a spirit thing. You might have your mind made up. I'm not going to be like that. But if you're not giving proper heed to God, you can be taken by a seducing spirit. Seducing spirits, doctrines of devils, hang on to that one. Speaking lies in hypocrisy. Now, we know what hypocrisy is, don't we? Does, does, does anybody want to help me with that? Hypocrisy? Being a hypocrite? Not following, Not following your own doctrine, what you say? Wearing a false face? A false face. Yeah, but you can't use the word in the definition. That was a good one, though. I, she said hypocritical behavior. You no. Know, it is wearing a false face really is being a hypocrite. You know, that's what they called um, that's what they called actors. That's where it comes from, those that were pretending to be another person. Now, we know that actors are not hypocrites by being actors are pretending to be somebody else. We know they're actors, or at least we should. And we know they're pretending to be somebody else, right? You know when they're on TV and they do things, it's not, it's not for real. Yes. She's right, saying one thing. Well, yeah, uh, someone online said saying one thing and doing another. But it's a little more, it's a little more complicated than that. It's when you're saying one thing to fool people but you're secretly something different or doing something different. Yes, it does. Being deceitful. Yes, it has everything to do with being deceitful. It is when you're pretending to be something that you're not. When, who, what, my, my, well, she's, she's long dead and gone now. I had an aunt that would sit and watch TV shows, and when folks would get shot, she'd, be pleading the blood of Jesus and laying hands on the TV because she thought that was real. That's acting. Some folks are like that in real life, though, and you think they're something. And then when they get caught, we sit around saying, I never thought it. I would have never suspected they were like that because they had everybody fooled. That's a hypocrite. Now, let's go back to the scripture. They're speaking lies in hypocrisy, right? So they're pretending like they're saved. They're acting like they're under the spirit. But really, they're telling lies. Some people are so good, they can fall all out in the anointing and be shaken and acting like they're speaking in tongues and telling you something about God, and they lying the whole time. Some folks are very good at that. How do you get that way? How do you get to the place to where you can pretend like you're saved, but you're lying to people? 
because you don't have a proper respect for God. If you did, you would be scared to do something like that. They don't have any fear of God. But they didn't get that way at first. She said they don't have a fear of God. It takes time to get to the place to where you don't fear God. It does. Yes, sir. He said that some people teach now that the fear of God doesn't mean having a fear of God. It just means having lo a loving relationship with him. Well, the Bible says this. It's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of a living God. So now how does that work? It's a, it's a loving relationship to fall into the hands of a living God? Nah, that's not what he was talking about. He was talking about folks not living right. You can play church all you want to and have all the gods you want to, but once you get into the hands of the living God, yeah, you're going to be scared. They lie. They will come to church and say that God told me they will get up and preach. Well, the way I see it, they do all kinds of things. Oh, it don't mean that. If you go back to the Greek, it says, and then they start spouting off stuff. They don't even know if they're pronouncing it right. They start pr spouting off stuff and say, that really means, and then change it. Do you know when... You are an alcoholic, and you saved, and you go back, and you start drinking again. That's not the one that's going to be dogging somebody for, for using drugs. Because they know they self, they, they guilty. So when you, when you get somebody that starts off with the, well, now the Bible says judge not. That's because they doing wrong and they don't want you condemning them and they trying to justify themselves for not condemning somebody. But here's the bottom line. Anytime you witness to somebody, you have already judged them having not been saved. And this is the reason why I'm telling you how to get saved. Isn't that judging? You don't go to you don't go into a church filled with sanctified people that's living holy filled with the Holy Ghost, and witness to them how to get saved. You don't do that, do you? No. We do that to people that we judge are not saved. All right. So, now, where does he say that at? Judge not that you be not judges. Matthew 7. Grab it real quick then. I hear you talking, but I'm not sure if you know what you're talking about. Matthew 7 and 1. Judge not that ye be not judged. For with what judgment ye judge, ye shall be judged. And with what measure ye meet, it shall be measured to you again. So shame on you for judging. Yes, sir. Sure. First Corinthians chapter six. All right. Dare any of you having a matter against another go to the law before the unjust and not before the saints? Do ye not know that the saints shall judge the world? And if the world shall be judged by you, are ye unworthy to judge the smallest matter? Know ye not that we shall judge angels? How much more things that pertain to this life? If then ye have judgments of things pertaining to this life, set them to judge who are least esteemed in the church. I speak to your shame. It is, or is it so, that there, that there is not a wise man among you? No, not one 
that shall be able to judge between his brethren. But brother goeth to law with brother, and that before the unbelievers. Now, uh, there's another one. Uh huh. Her question is Is it judging when someone is committing adultery or someone's been brought up on charges? Well, first of all, you're innocent until proven guilty, right? With man. But with God, you're guilty if you never get caught. If you're, if you're wrong, you're wrong. And, and you don't, God doesn't care about you trying to prove your case to him because he can get all the way down into the intent of your heart. All right, so you can't fake with him. But let's say the person is guilty. Is it wrong? Are you, You're saying, isn't that judging? Or is it wrong to judge that? Ah. So you're saying it's not really judging if you're seeing them in sin and you're witnessing to them. That's not really judging. No, it's not. All right. No, that's not judging. But what, what happens when you don't know and you start a conversation with somebody to talk to them about the Lord because you want to you wanna be a witness and you don't know them? People do that all the time. Or, or, or let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 2. And who? Verse, verse 10. No, verse 11. For what man knoweth the things of man, save the spirit of man which is in him? Even so, the things of God knoweth no man but the spirit of God. Now, we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit which is of God, that we might know the things that are freely given unto us of God, which things also we speak, not in the words which men's or man's wisdom teacheth, but which the Holy Ghost teacheth, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. But the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit, for they are foolishness unto him. Neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned, right? All right, so he lays the foundation of what is spiritual and what is natural, what can be given and understood through spiritual and natural. The natural things men get because they are natural. Spiritual things you only get if you have the spirit. Verse 15, but he that is spiritual judges all things. Yet he himself is judged of no man. Now wait, I thought the Bible just got through saying judge not. And yet here, Paul says, he that is spiritual judgeth all things, yet he himself is judge of no man. For who have known the mind of the Lord, that he may instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. When you are saved, when you are spiritual, you can judge things. We have that authority. We can say something is right or wrong. Why? Because we have the mind of Christ, right? Did I misread that? Verse 16, the last sentence, but we have the mind of Christ. If you have the mind of Christ, you have the right to judge things. But just because you judge something doesn't mean that you have the right to take action on it. I may judge a situation and go down in prayer for that person. That doesn't mean I have the right to come up to him and say, brother, you in sin. You better get right or you go into the lake. It doesn't mean that. Some folks feel like they have a right to do that. No, we can judge a matter. And when it is brought before us, 
we have the right to judge because we've got the mind of Christ. If someone comes and asks you, is this wrong? You have the right to judge it when you're living right. When you're saved and when you are being obedient to the Spirit, you have the right to judge that. But you don't go into a bar and say, all of y'all are sinners. You don't do that. You may know they are. Why? Because I've judged it. I know they are. But that doesn't give me the right to go in and chase them away from God. Right? You know, there's times when a judge will know something in a case and he have to keep his mouth shut. Let the lawyers duke it out. And then let this legal system iron it out. He may know that the evidence is overwhelming, but because of the way it was gotten, I have to keep my mouth shut and, and keep that evidence out. I have to do that. And I know folks will get mad and say, he's a judge, and he said they can't uh, allow them to say this, that, and other. They, he won't let them bring this into the court. He's just as crooked as the rest of them. No, he's the judge, but he still has to obey the rules too. We are judges, but we have to obey the rules too. Just because we know something doesn't mean we have to beat somebody up over it. All right. Yes, sir. Oh, I thought you did this first, then covered your yawn. I'm sorry. All right. Um, back to 1 Timothy 4. Uh, let's see. 1 Timothy 4. And then we get to the, the heart of the matter, I think, is what Sister Sandra had brought up. They, in verse 2, speaking lies and hypocrisy. How are they able to do this? Because having their conscience seared with a hot iron, I don't feel it anymore. God bothered them at first. The Holy Ghost would poke you at first, but after a while, you kept on doing wrong, kept on doing wrong, giving heed to seducing spirits, to the doctrines of devils, and that is extremely important because we are the children of God. The only doctrine that we should have should come from the Bible. That's the only place our doctrine should come from. You can read extra biblical material. You can read other people's books. That's, I don't have a problem with that. I'm not saying that. But when it comes down to doctrine, it should come from one place. The word of God. Yes, ma'am. Um, she said, where's the scripture that talks about judging righteous judgment? Uh, that's Old Testament, isn't it? It's not. John 7, 24. Is that it? Yeah. All right, John 7 and 24 says, Judge not according to the appearance, but judge righteous judgment. Yes. Um, and But that, again, is dealing with how we judge a matter, not by how it looks, but by what it is. All right? Um. Romans chapter 1. Now, the having their conscience seared with a hot iron, he's dealing with those that are saved that won't do right. Not sinners. He's dealing with those that are saved but won't do right. That's not talking about sinners. Sinners don't get their conscience seared with a hot iron because they don't have a conscience. Or that's all they've got is a conscience, but... They don't have the Holy Ghost to show them. The Bible says where there is no law, there is no transgression. 
until they understand and are converted, they really don't get it. Um, if any man shall call on the name of the Lord, he shall be saved. And how shall they call on him in whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? Right? Well, hearing comes from who telling it? Who? The preacher. All right? Not everybody's a preacher. Some of them get in the pulpit and they speak, but they're not preachers. They weren't called by God. They weren't even qualified. Some were called and they jumped out before they were qualified. Hearing comes from listening to a preacher. So there's a whole lot of folks will say, oh, you can't make me believe they don't know. They go to their church and you know their pastor's preaching this, that, and the other. You don't know whether he's a preacher or not. How do they hear? Without a preacher. You've got to be a preacher. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> yeah, she's right. Said her mother used to say some were sent and some went. She's right about that. Well, let me let me change it a little bit now. Some were sent and a whole lot went. Yes, a whole bunch of folks is just went now. All right, in Romans chapter one, this is the person that refuses to listen to God. To all that be in Rome, beloved of God, verse 7, called to be saints, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. First, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for you all that your faith is spoken of throughout the world. For God is my witness, whom I serve with my spirit and the gospel of his Son, that without ceasing I make mention of you always in my prayers making request if by any means now at length I might have a prosperous journey by the will of God to come unto you. Now, this is Paul dealing with the churches at Rome and his desire to be with them because he wants to impart some knowledge, something to these people. He said, for I long to see you that I may impart unto you some spiritual gift to the end ye may be established. They're struggling. They're struggling to find their way. This is new to them. But then if you go down to verse 17, for therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith as it is written, the just shall live by faith. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of saints, of men. All unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness. He's talking about the person who knows what is right and won't tell nobody else about it either. He won't do it and he won't tell nobody about it. There are some people who know what the truth is, but they're not going to tell you. If I tell you what's right, then I'm guilty too. So I'll just keep it to myself. He goes on and he's explaining this. Because that which may be known of God is manifest in them, for God hath showed it unto them. So they're not just reciting back something they heard. God revealed it to them. I'll leave it alone. For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things which are the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Now who is he talking about? He's talking about the intelligent man now. You have enough sense to go back and carbon date how old the earth is, and then turn around and say, you think it all just happened by chance? Uh-uh. You have the ability to understand. And yet, even with all of that, you still deny the power of God. They get so angry. And this is just kind of playing. I'm 
sometimes I say things and it's harsh and I don't mean to be harsh, but it, you, you're, you're playing deceptively when you say things like, um, what is it they call that now? They don't want to say there's a God, but there's a some some kind of design. Design? No. In, intelligent design. There's something that's intelligent that designed all of this. That's just trying to not look bad when you say things like that. No. In the beginning, God created. Period. You don't have to try and hem it in for folks that's intelligent and so you don't sound stupid. No, because the Bible says God chose the foolish things of this world to confound the wise. So it may sound foolish to them, but the bottom line is it's not intelligent design. It's God's design. He made it. That's the way it is. Exactly. They don't want, they don't want to say God. That way they don't get into too hot of an argument with somebody. But the thing is, don't argue with them. You can't make people accept the truth. God doesn't even do that. You can't beat people up and make them understand that it's a God thing. It's by faith. You can't make them do that. So they get close. The invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen. Now here's what the scientists say. They believe in the Big Bang. That's back when all matter was infinitely dense and infinitely small. It's so small that if you were standing a foot away from it, you couldn't see it. If you had a microscope, you wouldn't have been able to see it. All things that we see right now, they say, was that small. Everything, not just this planet, all matter in the entire universe was that small. That tightly, densely packed. And then it Big bang took place and all of this came into existence. And it's like, yeah, well, the Bible says that. The invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen. It, it, you can say that it was infinitely dense and infinitely small if you want to, to describe something that's invisible. But God already said it. It was invisible, but it all came to where you can see it now, right? But they don't want to say God, so then they come up with all these great big old theories to try and explain away that God did it. He already said, I took the invisible things and made everything that you can see from it. So you, th these scientists ain't come up with nothing clever. Because that, here we go, because that when they knew God, they glorified him not as God. Neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Now, I, I was just looking at uh, um, a documentary the other day about, uh, about the particle accelerators, and they were talking about going back as far as they could and understanding the beginning of the universe. And it was, he, they were getting off into some pretty deep stuff. But one, at one point, one of the, the theoretical scientists said, um, something must have really loved us a lot to make all of these things happen just the way it did so that we could have a universe that exists like it does. This scripture deals with that kind of mindset because that when they knew God, they glorified him not as God. All he could say was something must have loved us. That is not giving God glory. That's not giving him credit. That is saying something. I'm not going to give it a name because I don't want to look bad. Why not just say it? There had to be a God. And he had to love us enough to make all of this. Why not say that? Verse 22, professing themselves to be wise, what happens to them? The more they run their mouth, the sillier they become. They don't even realize it. They keep going higher and higher and higher. Oh, and now we figured this out and we figured that out and we understand how this came in. Just run in their mouths and don't realize the more they talk, the more foolish they sound. When will they find out? When God reveals it all to them. And then they'll say, wow, he was over here and we was way over there. Yes, ma'am. Yes, she said it isn't it, Speaks, it says that in Daniel that knowledge will increase. Knowledge is increasing. That is true. 
especially today, the children have access to knowledge that they can do this and get information that you had to go to the library and do some serious research before to get. They can get it in a couple minutes. We do it all the time now. It's like, well, what, when did this happen? I don't know, Google it. What is, that, what is that saying? Our knowledge is increasing. We have access to information unprecedented. Un, I mean, you can sit down right now with your phone and look up how a nuclear bomb is made. You can. How did, what did you have to do before? You had to go to the library and try to figure out what section it would even be in. You did. I, I can remember going there. We'd go through the cards and be writing numbers down. And then you would go and you find the book and you'd open it up and look for a while. Nope, that's not it. Scratch it off your list and go find the next book. You'd be there all day long. Now you can just look it right up and there's everything you need to know. They'll give you step-by-step -step instructions. I wouldn't advise you doing that, not trying to make one. I wouldn't advise you even looking it up. Amen. You might get... Mm-hmm. <laughs> yes, she said, no, they might not even knock. You're right. They might not. They just break your door down and come in and take your stuff. There's some stuff you shouldn't be looking up. Not because you don't want to be on the watch list, but because you ain't got no business looking it up anyway. Yes, ma'am. Yes. She said most people don't realize that the government and everybody's got access to what you do what you're doing online, absolutely. And here's the thing, the, the internet is not some something that sits out somewhere mystically. It's all you're doing is connecting into somebody else's computer and getting the information from them, that's all. That's, in, that's the entire internet, it's just a whole bunch of interconnected computers and everybody's got information on them and you're just gaining access to their information. Yes, ma'am. Oh, yes. She said that's why they're telling these young people that what they put online will follow them the rest of their life. Absolutely. If you don't want it put on a bulletin or a billboard, don't put it on your computer. Don't tell people. And a lot of them, they think they put stuff on their Facebook and I don't have, I don't share with anybody, just my friends. They get access to that. You go to, you go to a company. I'm just, our company does it the one I used to work for, they do that. They, we fired people for what they've had on their Facebook pages. We have. You think you got your stuff all private? No, you don't. It's nothing is private on the Internet. Nothing. And you can go, you watch these TV shows where they're trying to track down the hacker that's done, got into something and they're, they're going through all these different changes and all that, and, and they're, oh, he, no, it bounced in, into Afghanistan. No, wait, no, no, it's over into France now. Please, if they want you, they ain't going through all that. No, they don't have to. They can get you right now. By the time you click enter, they can be at your door. Don't think that you're hiding anything. Some folks think they're so clever. Well, I just deleted it all off my computer. You ain't deleted nothing. You think your computer's the only place where it's being stored? Oh, no, 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 no. They got servers all over the world that's storing all this information. They know what you're doing. So that's how come I don't look up stuff like, how do you kill your wife? <laughs> <laughs> Folks are silly enough to do stuff like that. How do you get away with murder? Why, why would you look up something like that? Yes. She said they'd, get, they'd go on the internet and look up how to, how, how to buy all this stuff. They'll not only look up what to buy, but how to use it. How do you, how do you tie their hands so they can't get apart? A and then how do you dispose of a body without getting caught? I mean, type all that kind of stuff in there. And then when their spouse comes up missing and they come and take their computers, it's like, well, they tried to delete it, but we followed the, the breadcrumbs. <laughs> we got their search history. You ain't deleted anything. Or they write the list down. <laughs> Just silly.
No, oh, we out of time. But look, you haven't, you haven't done anything slick. And that's just trying to keep man from knowing. If man knows, what do you think about God? Man knows what you do. God knows what you intend to do. We just have to, and, and we didn't get into it. You, if you read the whole thing, at some point, um, I just want to read one verse here, and then we'll conclude with another one. But I, I want you to see something, and this is, a lot of times people, they find this hard to accept because they've, they've bought into this notion that God has unconditional love for everybody. Verse 24. Romans 1 and 24, wherefore God also gave them up to uncleanness. Who did that? God did that to them. He gave them up to uncleanness to dishonor their own hearts, or, to, or I'm sorry, to uncleanness through the lust of their hearts to dishonor their own bodies between themselves. God, because they would not accept God for who he was, God perverted their minds. People don't like to think that. And will get very angry with you if you say that. But listen, it's here. It's in the word. If the Bible says, do what I say or I'm going to turn you over to something, oh, there's quite a list here of things that God turned these people over to. Quite a list. Now, you don't get all of it. But one of these, God will turn you over to something. You just keep on messing with him. He can turn you right over. And for the rest of your life, you think that right is left and left is right. And have no clue. Look what he did to Nebuchadnezzar. Made him crawl around for three years like an animal. Seven years like an animal. Eating grass. The man, the man built an empire that had two of the seven man-made wonders of the world in it. He was brilliant, but he wouldn't give God glory. So God made him act like an animal for seven years. Let his hair grow, the Bible said, like feathers. Oh, he, he, he tore him up. Real quick, Ecclesiastics, real quick. We'll, we'll finish up with this. I'm reading all that because I want us to understand that there is a, not only is there a, a proper amount of respect that we should have for God and the things of God. But there is punishment to go along. Not by man. God will get you. Verse chapter 12. I think it is. The last chapter. Verse chapter 12 verse 13. Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Let's sum it all up then. Fear God and keep his commandments. For this is the whole duty of man. You ain't got to go through no whole bunch of hoops and different things. The conclusion is if you want to be right, then fear God and just do what he says. You can be okay. You don't have to go out and, and build a tabernacle to God by hand. Just you. You don't have to try and imitate what Solomon did, building a temple for the Lord and all that. He said, here's, here's the conclusion of all of it. Just fear God. Just do what he said do. That's what your duty is as a man your, or human. That's your duty. That's all. All right. Any questions? Yes, ma'am. She said, I made the statement that about a saved person that just won't do right. But how can they be saved and not do right? That and do what they want to do. And how can they do that and then come back and think they're saved? Well, just because a person does something wrong and comes to church and pretends like they're right doesn't mean that they think they're right. So we just don't want other people to think we're wrong. So we'll put on our game face when we come to church. Everybody, everybody that's wrong will go to hell for it, okay? If I can say it this way. Nobody will be in hell and not know why. If you're not living right, 
you know you're not living right. If you're not doing right, you know you're not doing right. And you may come to church and grin and, and wave your hands all around and all that and clap. Just like everybody else, just getting right in with the flow with everybody and just rocking and ooh, mm, that message, ooh, you can do all that if you want to. But you know deep down inside you're not doing right. You know you're not living right. And you know you're just doing that because you don't want folks to think something's wrong with you. But are they saved? No. Are you, I mean, how, how many sins do you have to commit to be uh, liable for going to hell? How many does it take? One. So till you get yourself right, no, you're not. Yes, sir. Yes. Where is it? First John chapter three, and verses eight and nine. All right, go ahead. He that committeth sin is of the devil, for the devil sinneth from the beginning. For this purpose the Son of God was manifest, that he might destroy the works of the devil. Whosoever is born of God doth not commit sin, for his seed remaineth in him, and he cannot sin because he is born of God. Anytime, anytime we are saved, then we stop, we cease from sin. Now you go out and do wrong, you got to get that cleaned up and get right with God. But this isn't like, if I can say it this way without being, I don't want anybody to think I'm being derogatory because I'm not. This is not like the Catholic Church where you just go do what you want to do and then keep coming and confessing. It's not like that. You do wrong, confess it or Get it cleaned up, get prayer, and don't do it no more. Yes, ma'am. Well, that's what he says. I think it's in the book of Proverbs where he says, he, whosoever confesseth and forsaketh. You know, you, you, can't just, you can't just come and get prayer and it's in the back of your mind. I hope, I ain't, I hope I'm not presented with that again because I, I don't think I'll be able to do it. That's not really repenting. Because for sure, you will be presented with it again. If, if you saw some money on the table and you just took it and put it in your pocket, took it out your pocket and put it back. All right? So you're going to be presented with that again. You, this is not the first time you saw loose change laying around. It won't be the last either. Get the victory now, and you'll keep getting the victory. All right. Is that, did, did I answer your question? All right. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, yes. She said, just because you say praise the Lord doesn't mean that you're saved because anybody can say praise the Lord. What scripture did I? The Psalm, yeah, Psalm. This, yeah, it's in one of the Psalms. Let everything that have breath praise ye the Lord. Everything should praise the Lord, but everything doesn't understand why. Yes, sir. Yes, he did say that. He was talking about the, the children of Israel. He said, they praise me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. They did. They talked about God, and they talked about godly things, but they wasn't interested in serving God. They just weren't. They were interested in doing their own thing. All right? I anything else? Any, anybody? All right. Stand up. <laughs>